that's it. Thank you. Yeah, so Adam, when I got the invite, um, you know, with this pandemic, uh, I think there's a lot of us that became internet personalities. So um, I took this opportunity to think, to present uh, some ideas that we had, and I'm I'm happy to see that we've got some builders that presented as well too. So I enjoy building things in my basement, um, but, you know, at EVNR, we do a lot of thinking about you know where robotics are going and, and we've been in the business 25 years um so i'm taking this opportunity to talk about something a little bit different i'll tell you guys a little bit about what evnr does uh, our mission it's it's humanizing robotics and, and really what that means is to make robotics easy we live in the manufacturing space so you see here we've got a robot polishing a hip stem for it's an orthopedic implant um, so we spend a lot of time with a lot of critical parts and customers that have a lot of fun trying to find good people to uh, in their manufacturing environments. So we take some of those tough processes, bring it into a robot world and automate them. Um, we've got two technology verticals. One's uh, robotic finishing, which you're seeing right now, and the other is visual surface inspection. So you can imagine that, you know, these parts that are going into somebody's body they can't have any nicks, dings, scratches, uh, missed operations. So we also use a robot with a camera system to inspect to, to really small detail uh, these, these components. Um, now, all of our systems, uh, I'll just show you here, they're all in a box, right? And there's a method to our madness, you know, these yellow robots um, that you see in there, they're, they're industrial robots. They're, they're not, typically we don't use collaborative robots because they're, they're pretty strong arms that we need. We're putting a lot of force on, on these robots. And then there's the dust collection. Um, but as as the robot world is changing, and, and I think the past five years, uh, we saw the great presenters say there's some really cool things, uh, climbing stairs, going down mines. Um, so we started to think, OK, where what will the robotics world look like in 10 years? And I'll, I'll probably touch upon a lot of your buzzwords, Adam. You know with ai and blockchain and stuff like that so um but we we had some ideas we we got into some tough projects we realized that there's little bits of those tough projects that could um uh represent something interesting for the future so in my basement i put together a little mvp and that and that's what i'll talk about today okay um so the whole concept it, it goes around you know robots are out of their cages you know, a couple of years ago, the, they were working side by side with people. They were still in arm. I know people have been working on mobile robots for a long time, but all of a sudden, I, you know, I don't know if it was Boston Dynamics or who gets the credit, but it became mainstream for robots to be roaming, you know, whether it's an agriculture uh, shop floor in a hospital. Um, there's there's just so many applications. And, you know, the common theme is these robots are looking to help people, right? They're looking to help us do something. Um, I got involved in a project. So this is an aerospace project. And this, this is all public stuff. It's a, out of a, a newspaper article um, where we really had to generalize the question, OK, what do we do next? What, does, what should the robot do next? Because flowing through this line could be a wide range of products. So you didn't have time to reconfigure things. It, was, it wasn't batch, it was single piece. You know, they make one and then they make one of something else. So that's where I kind of cut my teeth on understanding, okay, how do you set yourself up when you want to generalize what, you, what uh, should the robot do next? What is the optimal job? Um, so, you know, thinking forward and thinking about, okay, so we've got 5G coming, we've got these, the web infrastructure, all the cloud systems that are way more robust than uh, some of the automation systems. Back when I graduated in 2000, people would say, laugh at the idea of putting a computer in a manufacturing space, you know, the blue screen of death. Uh, so it was all PLCs. Now the tables have turned a bit. You know, if you want uh, a cloud-based system with a as close as possible to 100% uptime, there's solutions out there and very cost effectively. So I took that idea and I, I said, okay, what if we put that control system in the cloud um, where a robot can ask, okay, what do I do next? And what's the value of that? Like, what could be the benefit for some customers? It could make it very cost effective, 
make it very easy to set up um, a robot or multiple robots and make it easy to use. Um, potentially, it also can greatly increase the safety of, of what's going on because everything is just so much more robust. You've got to put some rules around when you're allowed to control the robot and things like that. But um, there, there's some pretty big uh, value propositions to uh, people using robots or, or who want to use robots. So essentially, it, the, the concept, and I'll, I'm going to walk you guys through it, but it's a RESTful API. It sits in the cloud, and I, it's, it's, there's an acronym, AGM, Adaptive Gold Management. I can't think of anything cooler. Uh, I should be saying the Robo, Roboverse or Robo Twitter or something like that. It's like a social media for robots where they go out and ask, okay, what's the next optimal thing for me to do? And then it responds back, okay, go perform this task with this group of instructions. And then when it's finished, it says, okay, I'm done to mark that complete. What's my next job? Okay. So let's just imagine here, you know, I have to make this widget. Um, so I've got on a shop floor, maybe you've got, you know, the steps I have to take is milling it. I've got to grind it. Then I've got to inspect it. Maybe I have to mark it and it's finished. Right? So I've got all those steps, and each one of those steps takes time. Now, let's say that I'm flowing through 100 of these different widgets, all different ones with different steps, but I want to use the same assets on the floor. So managing all those instruction sets, um, that becomes important. And let's say I want to have a fleet of robots. So let's say this first robot is busy doing something. Well, there's a job to do, so robot number two can chip in. So that's where I wrote RoboForce on this one. Um, I, I'm a, I spent a lot of time in sales too. I'm, I'm a, a geeky sales guy, so I do a bit of coding. And I, uh, but you know, the customer is always uh, uh, number one. Uh, but Salesforce, that's really what opened me up to you know some of the cloud, uh, the cloud computing, um, and also taking an ambiguous task of selling something to somebody and you know breaking it down into steps and and running a sales team so i, I was a lot of this is inspiring from you know kind of working through that and realizing what could be what could be done so here i have a whole bunch of jobs so imagine each one of these robots has its own twitter account and so somebody's setting up and, and deploying jobs to these all these different robots all centralized into one platform so just to show a little bit what that looks like, um, I've got a virtual machine running on my computer here. Um, so you've got a, an MIR robot. This is all in ROS, and this is running around in simulation. And then here's this app. It's out in Heroku. So it's, it's out in the cloud. So if I log in, and there's my manufacturing at home. Okay, so then I can start to see, okay, what, let me configure my jobs. So I've got a, a robot. This is my setup of my robot, my position of it, uh, the IP address, my ways of communicating to it. And then I've got the steps. So I showed you that, that chart. Um, so here's a full production sequence. You've got your milling set up. You've got your grinding. You've got five or six different steps. But maybe I just want to machine only, or maybe I just want to inspect only. Okay. So once I have all that set up, you go ahead, you can activate jobs. And um, let's see, what's the best way to show you? Sometimes when I'm streaming, things slow down a little bit here. So here, it, this robot, I called it Tesla. It's, it's working on taking uh, from source M9, so M9 workstation, over to uh, the destination T4, to the table four, it's going from machine number nine. So as it, it goes, uh, that's its set of tasks to do here, okay? Now, that's all cool. Um, I think when we started saying, okay, this is interesting, so we can be cost-effective, we can put things into the web. Um, where, you know, what goes beyond this? What's What can really open up this? Um, and we started looking and building a very simple dashboard of what's going on here. And 
you know, imagine you know, when we go to the get our haircut. I got my haircut this weekend for this show, so let's make sure I look good for your your audience, Adam. And you know, when the job was done, I paid for my haircut, right? So we were thinking, well, wouldn't that be great? Now that we're you know distributing work and we are understanding when the job is finished, what if we could start? Um, do, you know, implementing this as a robot as a service. So as the robot finishes its job, let's pay that robot for its job or the owner of the robot. Okay. So then the next step, and this is what I've, I've been working on the past uh, few weeks, is there, Adam, you, you guys, uh, I, I listened in on some of your blockchain talks. Um, I think you did one on Ethereum. Um, but this web three concept so all of a sudden you have these public utilities you know like uh, a paypal but it's built for programmers and it's able to move money around so i i started using the stellar blockchain and this opens up some interesting things you can represent a robot as an asset and then i could take that robot and let's say adam you you buy the robot from me so you become the the asset owner and then whenever that robot does a, does a job, a user uh, does a transaction, and because you're the owner of the robot, you receive you know some some form of royalty or payment for that job. So there's a few scenarios that we've kind of worked out as an MVP that we want to to try out. So one scenario is where you know um, uh, us as a robot builder, we have a robot. We're going to put it out in the field and get paid for somebody using that robot another we could have a partner so let's say i have a distributor they are distributing the robot so they would receive payment for the the robot doing the work or a third the customer themselves so right now uh, we're expanding the the mvp to kind of uh, to uh, use the stellar blockchain to implement this robot as a service model now that we've got all of these jobs being managed so in a nutshell, that's what we what we see for that. Those are our ideas for where we think this robotic world could take us. And when we combine some of the things coming out, uh, you know, five G. It's maybe not necessary for you know the uh, uh, just asking for jobs. But if you want to get into some advanced controls and have a robust, maybe you're going to monitor the shop floor. Maybe you're going to uh, also monitor spindle speeds and, and different things like that 5g network could greatly open up and ruggedize some of the control systems uh, for this got the blockchain coming on and then of course all this ai and machine learning that is just becoming so much easier so a guy like me in my basement can can fool around with these concepts so adam i'll stop sharing my screen and i can open up for some questions I should say that it is. Uh, I'll drop a link to the to the the app. It is out there, free to use. Uh, anybody can go kick the tires and uh, give it a try. So, um, Frank, if you want to put one of your robots and connect it up to this, uh, I'd be happy to work with you and give that a go. Where to go? Um, so, Stephen has asked. Uh, uh, a question around blockchain, which you kind of mentioned there. Is it, is it what choice of Stellar blockchain? Is it just for payments? It's for payments and also for managing assets. So there's a big NFT craze that would give you a good flavor for managing unique assets uh, in the web. Um, but the Stellar blockchain allows you to create an asset and associate it to an owner or an account. So that it does those two functions. Um, and the Stellar blockchain, it's unique for two things, well, a few things, but there's, it's it's fairly quick, which is a good plus. Um, and also, you can, your path payments, so you don't need to transact in Stellar Lumens, which is their native currency. I can go from US dollars to Canadian dollar, dollars without even having to worry about anything. It's got a, a decentralized, a automatic uh, uh, market making tool that allows you to leverage, you know, different uh, stable coins that are out there. Nice one. Yeah, good, good question there, Stephen. 
Um, so look, yeah, we'll leave it open for for a little bit there, Mike, on on the topic of questions there. Um, I, I suppose just a general kind of you know kind of open ended question there for yourself. I mean, what do you see as kind of the biggest challenges and and kind of opportunities in this uh, industrial kind of robotics and automation space there? Uh, biggest challenges and opportunities, um, you know, making things easy for people. Uh, that's a big challenge. Uh, Frank, you mentioned cost as well. So if we're going to have these robots come into our homes or help out in a bigger way, they do need to be cost effective. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, right now, there's, there's some out of China. Like this is, I, I don't know whether to be afraid or to be happy because when we look at the US, for example, the amount they invest in defense, it dwarfs the next five countries. When we look at manufacturing, China does that in manufacturing and robotics is a key technology. So for example, I came across a collaborative robot that is looks to be fairly industrialized uh, for $5,000. It's a 10th of the price of some of the typical uh, industrial robot collaborative robots that we see. So even mm -hmm. if it lasts, you know, a few a year, how many times do you have to buy or service it before you get to that 50 $60,000? Mm -hmm. So I, I think the price will come down. Um, I think we need to be part of it because, you know, I, I'm happy to see the innovation here in Canada. Um, otherwise, we're going to get left behind and we're going to be the ones copying for the next 30 years and trying to catch up and modernize our society. So um, I do think it's a bit of an arms race in technology. Uh, AI is, is another big spot that, you know, when you go to some of the Asian cities, uh, Singapore, and you just realize that their infrastructure is, is much further ahead than ours is right now. So um, a lot of good work to do here. Yeah, no, I think as as a, I mean, a Canadian PR myself and having personally lived in Singapore myself, I find that, yeah, look, it, I think it, Canada takes on that very uh, American style of business where it's kind of like, I don't know if it's really empowering the users. It's more about like, hey, we're big corporate banks and you're going to have to use us because we're the only options you have. Um, and I find that a lot of European and, and you know, specifically from back home from where I am in Australia, there's a lot of like the, the fintech space and all this in short tech, like it's, it's light, well, not light years, but it is streets ahead of, of kind of what's happening in Canada. And I did find when I did move here is in kind of consuming some of these fintech and insurance products, like looking at the experience, I'm like, this is like, early 2000s technology and they're mm. spinning it off as like oh this is a great banking app i'm like no this this experience is is terrible and it's why i'm leaving bemo as a bank because their app sucks the experience is is terrible um we have some other questions here i'm not going to rant anymore uh, damien has asked uh do you think there is a chance for democratizing manufacturing if a robotic cloud or a robot as a service becomes available for public use Oh, absolutely. Um, and at one point I thought adopting a cloud system would be a, a, uh, a problem for these manufacturing companies. There's a lot of, uh, let's say paranoia around their data and making sure the infrastructure is okay and they, they control it. But when you look at the amount of business data we put into the web, whether it's Salesforce and the big, big companies using that, or, uh, all the ERPs are, are moving to the cloud. I think it's a, it's the next natural thing to think about, okay, how can we do this automation much more robustly and, and much more cost effectively in the cloud? Um, when you compare, so that, that picture I showed of the, um, that yellow robot where I said, I, I learned some of the, I cut my teeth on some of these, uh, algorithms. Um, we, we built all that on the C Siemens WinCC platform. And when I compare developing in that to developing in, you know, uh, uh, React with MongoDB, it's, there's no, the, the React, MongoDB, these web systems are, are years ahead of, of what you can do with some of these uh, automated control systems. So there's, there's a lot of opportunity there. And I, I don't know when it'll happen, but my bet is that that's going to create, a, open up a whole bunch of new things for, for automation people. Nice. And uh, we've got another question here from Stephen. Stephen has asked, in IT, there is a trend of microservices. Maybe it would be nice to have some Lego-like robot as a service. 
uh, where you assemble robots for small autonomous parts that can interact. Uh, I don't know if that's more of a question as a statement, but what are your thoughts on that uh, Lego like robot as a service where you can kind of put bits and pieces together of different robots? Yeah, I, you know, the other trend that I think is coming instead of having, you know, that yellow industrial robot that, okay, what creative things can we do with it? You know, with things like Ross, Ross 2, uh, these open source platforms, I think there's going to be custom built uh, robots or, or purpose built robots that perform a function. So, you know, thinking them as uh, of them like a microservice and having them act together. Um, if you if you've got a an angle on that, that could be a great a great uh, thing to pursue. Because um, I think a good TV show we should do is like you know the counting cars where they refurbish cars. I think we need a, a good robot show where they they some cool guys build some purpose built robots. Uh, I think it's coming to that, and there's going to be some really interesting things.